as in previous weeks, please uh, give us feedback, uh, especially if there's some topics that you want to hear about. And we're, we're definitely uh, engaged with market news and, and giving you timely information. But if there's anything specific you'd like to hear more about, please let us know. Um, and with that, I'll hand it over to Brian Parman. Hey, thanks, Dave. Um, so glad to be back again this week, uh, presenting this information to you guys. A lot of stuff's happened. Uh, some information has come out, and uh, I'm going to try to put the macro situation together best I can and kind of try to tie it into ag. So another week and another uh, set of unemployment figures has come out. And on my next slide, I've kind of changed the graph around because we're getting more of these unemployment weeks. And the, the way I'd uh, shown it last week wasn't very is getting kind of busy. So just to reiterate for those who haven't seen this before, uh, what we have is in March, we had record unemployment filings. It spiked up really quickly to about 6.8 million from 3.3, which are 3.3 was a massive record. 6.8 was obviously more than double that. Uh, it started trending downwards. We're having fewer millions of people uh, uh, filing for unemployment uh, every week, but it's still historically high. Uh, it, when, when you when you think about the fact that before this had ever even occurred, it was 695,000 was the most people who'd ever filed for unemployment, new unemployment filings in a week. And so my next slide kind of shows exactly, uh, when we talk about unemployment, that the there are different metrics for actually how it is uh, uh, basically analyzed, okay? And some folks will say unemployment and mean one thing, and some folks will say unemployment and mean something else. And the two biggest ones that get used in the media and by economists are what are called U3 and U6. U3 is kind of the official unemployment figure that you'll see uh, posted around when they talked about in December and January unemployment around 3.5%, 3.6%, historically low. That was U3 unemployment, and that's total unemployed as a percentage of the silver civilian labor force, okay? And that's <coughs> but here's the thing. What is considered the labor force is, is very different between U3 and U6. And if you look at the U6, which is kind of what we naturally just think of unemployed, and that's the total unemployed plus anyone who is working part-time and wants a full-time job but can't find one, or working some low-paying job but is, is, is overqualified for it, or somebody who has just given up looking for a job altogether and because they can't find one and have been long-term unemployed, that's U6. So if you just leave the labor force and just give up, you're not in the counted in U3. You're counted in U6 though, which is why you see U6 being double sometimes or close to double what the U3 unemployment statistic that's often quoted is. And I bring that up because I want to show on my next slide kind of where the unemployment figures are projected to be. So the uh, 30.4 million new unemployment filings uh, due to the shutdown, okay, due to the national shutdown and COVID. So to put that into perspective, during the entire Great Recession, the entire portion of the Great Recession, uh, there were 37.12 million new unemployment filings. And that was from December 2007 through June of 2009, roughly 18 months, a year and a half. This was done in more like six weeks. Okay, so the amount of unemployed people uh, that, that filed for new unemployment in the, in the last six weeks is, is going to probably be more greater than the Great Recession in, in, the next, in the next few weeks, really, if these numbers keep up. So the U3 projection is between 18 and 24 percent, and we just talked about what U3 is, which would be that, that folks who are still looking for a job, uh, things like that. 18 to 24%. The U6 projection around 30 or more percent of the population who is either let, given up looking for a job or grossly underemployed or only working part time but would like to uh, find a full time job. So the question will be when it comes to this unemployment figure, and it's and it's a question on all of our minds and, and all of us economists, whether it's Tim, Frey, and myself, is how fast are these jobs going to come back and how many will actually come back. That's, that's really the, the biggest question. That is the million, the trillion dollar question now is how many and how fast? Because it's, it's not as if, if uh, you might think, well, if it was a viable restaurant, for instance, on some corner in Bismarck or Fargo, 
well, it will be a viable restaurant as soon as folks return to whatever form of normalcy that is. But it just not be, maybe it may not be the same ownership, it may not be the same employees, and it may take two years before that happens and somebody comes in and buys it for cents on the dollar and reopens it. So again, that's speaking to how fast will the jobs return and, and there may be some sectors where jobs don't return at all. Next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about glo uh, global growth because this is a global pan, it's called a pandemic because it's global, right? And we, I have been focused pretty exclusively on domestic issues for the last several segments, but I wanna talk about how this is affecting us, how this is affecting the globe and how it's gonna affect demand, exports, and, and jobs that count on those uh, domestically. So if we look at Canada GDP growth rate and, and, and the countries I've selected, let me back up, the countries I've selected are our biggest trading partners. The, I, I didn't choose them randomly. There's some of our biggest trading partners and especially some of our biggest ag trading partners. That's the important thing. So Canada basically had zero growth in uh, the first quarter of 2020, which uh, spoiler alert, that's the best one I'm going to show is almost zero. Uh, and then the U.S. is GDP growth rate minus 4.8%, and that's, a, that's a, a quarterly number. So my next slide shows two of our uh, next biggest trading partners. Obviously, China is a big one. China had about a 9.8% contraction in the first quarter. Uh, and this is according to the Bureau of uh, Labor Statistics or Bureau of Statistics of China, which is then compiled by us. But they're saying negative 9.8% in the first quarter, the largest drop in basically since they've been keeping records and actually went quasi-capitalist. Another big trading partner, Japan, their growth rate, negative 1.8% in the first quarter. And remember, Japan wasn't, a couple of those uh, countries over there like South Korea and Japan, it was thought that they had a pretty good grip on things and didn't, I don't think were as heavily impacted as, as some other countries. But that China number is, is, is extremely, uh, an extremely big contraction. Next slide, please. So the EU, another one of our big trading partners, down close to 4% in the first quarter. And then of course, Mexico, who was pretty late to being impacted according to the data we got on the number of COVID cases based on that Johns Hopkins map that everybody looks at, down about 1.6%. Uh, they, they'd been contracting a little bit the previous four quarters, but uh, apparently you know, they, they were not uh, without, without effect. And the big thing to keep in mind with this is this really only impacted uh, for us in Canada and Mexico the last couple of weeks in March. Now, China was impacted obviously much earlier than that, as were some of the other Eastern Asian countries like uh, Japan and South Korea, which I didn't show, but they were impacted much earlier. So, so the severity like in China, for instance, where everything originated is obviously much worse. And the expectation is that in the United States is going to show the same thing. Next slide, please. So the initial Q1 GDP contraction of negative 4.8% in the United States, 3.5% uh, was expected. That was the projected contraction. And remember that again, that was only two weeks. Now the other expectations are that it's going to be revised downward. It is very common during recessions to go back and re-revise the either growth or contraction back up or down uh, because the information coming in is very is lagged it's heavily lagged so they'll go back and say instead of 4.8 percent it was actually six percent or seven uh, and it could be quite large or maybe even double now the predictions are for this is predictions for q2 in 2020 it will be the single largest quarterly drop in gdp in u.s history that is I'll say that again, the predictions are that it will be the single largest quarterly drop in US history. The Congressional Budget Office projects 12% second quarter decline, and if I annualize that, it becomes a 40% contraction in US GDP. So literally our economy contracts 40% in a quarter. That is, that, is, that is pretty incredible. So if you look at 12%, plus the, the, uh, the, the quarterly drop in Q1, uh, it is it is pretty dramatic and obviously unprecedented. Next slide, please. So the big sectors that are affected, consumer uh, spending, which is about 70% of GDP, declined to 7.6%. So 70% of our gross domestic product went down almost a uh, little over 7.5%. 
Durable goods spending, those would be like TVs, things that tend to last a long time, uh, including cars and stuff, down 16%. Services, I'm a little surprised the services were only down 10% considering service industries were hit pretty heavily. Although, you know, you've got some folks like tax preparers and stuff who weren't really, maybe not impacted as much. Exports down 9% and then imports down 15.3%. So I guess if you wanted to see a close, uh, uh, a reduction in the in the gap between imports and exports. That's one way to do it, I suppose, is shut everything down. Next slide, please. So just a quick note on the Fed. The Fed, so there were some comments that came out from our Fed Chairman Jerome Powell and uh, other uh, heads of Federal Reserves around the country, and basically indefinite low interest rates. That's pretty much what they've said. It's probably not going to be quarters. It's probably going to be years. And the target that they want to reach, and this is something I've said in many of my talks many times that you guys have heard, about a 5% unemployment rate and 2% inflation is kind of the Fed's target. And, and the other thing to the big concern that they're having is the possibility of deflation. Okay, and if you guys remember, inflation is where your buying power, your dollar is reduced. Uh, prices are going up, so every dollar you have will buy less. Deflation is the opposite. Every dollar you have will buy more as prices actually decline. And that sounds like a really good thing initially, but it's but it, it really isn't because a lot of us, especially in agriculture, carry debt. And so during periods of deflation, your debt does not go down, but the value of the products that you're selling do. That's basically what happened in the Great Depression was rampant deflation where if you bought a bunch of land, uh, and bought it for whatever whatever price. Now the the prices of your commodity back then a big part of it was wheat was cut in half, uh, and prices everywhere else. But your debt was not cut in half to match the the declining prices. So you're stuck with this debt that you're not making enough money to pay back. Uh, and the same thing in a consumer society society with high student loan debts and credit card debts and things like that. Deflation is not helpful. To, to the average consumer. And the Fed chairman also said that more spending will be needed from Congress. We've already had unprecedented spending and unprecedented doesn't really do justice to the amount of spending and stimulation that's been pumped into the economy right now. But federal uh, Fed chairman Powell said that more may be needed. It, it may wind up happening. Uh, again, we just don't know, but I'm sure that you guys have seen in the news all the ideas being kicked around from mortgage forbearances to living wage payments to another round of uh, uh, paycheck, you know, money being sent just to just to consumers. So I believe that was my last slide. Uh, I'm obviously going to be on to address any questions that you might have on everything from interest rates to the macro economy to housing to whatever. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Frayn Olson. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Brian. Um, so I'm Frayn Olson. I'm a crop economist and marketing specialist with NDSU Extension. Uh, I'm going to try and springboard off of some of the things that Brian had started talking about and, and really look not just internally, domestically, but uh, what's happening kind of globally with this COVID-19 and what, are the, what is the impact um, economically on some of our major trading partners? And again, recognizing that in the, at least in the crop sector, uh, a large percentage of our grains end up going overseas. Uh, just again, a reminder of 40 to 45 percent of our soybeans are exported, approximately 50, 50, 50 percent of our wheat is exported, and about 15 percent, one five, is of our corn is exported. Again, so markets have a huge role to play in, in kind of the, the pricing of grain and, and potential economic recovery. So on my first slide, I try and, and provide just again a background on the definition of demand because right now the, the real underlying concern in the, in the markets is what is our demand base? How is our demand base changing? What does this demand base really look like? And so I wanted to make sure everybody understood what we're talking about. The, Broad definition of demand is a consumer's desire to purchase goods or services and willingness to pay a price for a specific good or service. So in a, in a very broad context, that's, that's what we talk about. But for this discussion today, I really want to talk more specifically about effective demand. And, and again, it's not necessarily just a play on words, but there's this, some subtle differential, different definitional differences, excuse me. 
So effective demand is a consumer want or need supported by an ability to pay. And the emphasis in this definition is on first the incomes. Your income provides individuals with a purchasing power which exercise in a marketplace. And consumers have a budget constraint. We, also, we often forget when we talk in very big picture sense that consumers have a budget constraint. So given your budget, how do you prioritize what you're gonna spend your money on? And one of the reasons we're watching the employment numbers so, so closely, as well as we're looking at kind of general economic um, contractions and the rate of those contractions is really tied back to what is this consumer's budget constraint? Um, if you've already been laid off or if you're concerned about job and job security, obviously your vision of your budget constraint is very different than if you were fully employed and the economy, economy was growing and expanding. So on the next slide, I tried to provide some background and context for kind of how large is the world's economies. So as we talk about these contractions, either expansions or contractions, typically in percentage changes, we've got to realize that these different economies are of different size. Now, I've tried very hard throughout the rest of my presentation to use one consistent source of data. And I'm, I'm, I'm leaning on the International Monetary Fund because they do a lot of work globally and they try and compare what's going on in different countries. So again, I'm worried about consistency of data and making sure that when we're making these relative comparisons that we're doing it correctly. So the most, the most recent consistent data where we have close out of accounts is 2018. You can see in the United States as a single country is the largest economy in the world. Um, on the right hand side, I also put an estimated population. Again, that's from the US Census Bureau. Uh, all of these numbers, again, on population are from U US Census Bureau. Um, so in the United States, we've got about a $20.5 trillion economy. China is about a $13.3 trillion economy, but obviously they have almost, well, a little over four times the population base we do. Um, and then those are really the big two single economies. Then we drop down to Japan and we get into some of the European countries like Germany, the UK, France, Italy. Um, um, India is also one of the top five or six. Again, you can see the population base there. And I often get questions, well, why don't we focus more on e exports, agricultural exports into India? And part of it is their economy is not quite as large, but they're also more self-sufficient in agriculture. So, you know, there's a lot of things going on kind of behind the scenes. But I did want to give a, a, an indication of the relative size of economies and that when we talk about a contraction in the U.S. economy, that has implications not only here, but also internationally. On the next slide, I, I also look at who are the major exporting countries? Who do we sell as the U.S. sell most of our agricultural products to? And again, um, the ranking we have here, this is USDA Foreign Ag Service data. The numbers here are from a data set that are slightly different than the data set that's being used for the phase one agreement. So the phase one trade agreement is using a slightly different bundle of agricultural products. Um, so the numbers here aren't gonna exactly match up to some of the things I've had in previous presentations. But the, the point is I wanna try and make, uh, 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 and emphasize the relative size. How much in dollar term, how much agricultural products do we export to these other countries? And, and I think surprising to a lot of people, Canada is actually number one. Very closely followed by China and then also Mexico. So those are kind of the top three. Um, and then we get into Japan, the European Union, and South Korea. And, and of the countries on this list, the one that I'm most personally most concerned, I'm trying to find more information out is about Mexico. Because um, again, Mexico is a, the number one buyer of US corn. It's the number two buyer of US soybean, and historically has been number one buyer of US wheat. And so Again, that Mexican demand base is very, very important for, for the crop sector as we move forward in time. On the next slide, I've tried to provide some historical background. Now this is again, GDP growth. So what's the growth rate? If, if it's positive, it's increasing, the, the economies are growing and we're asking how quickly are these economies growing? And the growth rate of GDP is one measure of kind of financial health of a country. So if we see a nice, stable, consistent GDP growth that's positive, you know, that, pr that provides us, and especially like in the United States case where it's a very large economy, as long as that continues to grow and is very stable, um, people feel very, very comfortable. 
Okay, so the red line is the United States. I'm using that as kind of our base and reference point. Now, if we look at the, the countries that we sell most of our com agricultural commodities to in the form of value, um, you can see that uh, China actually has a growth rate on a percentage term that's larger than the US. And, and I won't go into the details of why that's happening, but just understand um, we're trying to do accounting of these growth rates as accurately and consistently as possible. If you look at all of the other countries on this, on this chart or on this table, historically, with the exception of 2009, 9-10 uh, time period, primarily 2009, um, which was the last Great Recession, um, we're seeing relatively stable growth rates of, of all these countries. They're all within that two and a quarter or one to two and a half percent range, which is really considered to be acceptable in most people's minds. Now, the last two years of this chart, so the ones, the, the numbers or values for 2020 and 2021 are forecasted numbers. So this is where the International Monetary Fund has tried to forecast um, global growth as well as growth by country. And, and this is some information that just came out now in April um, from some runs or some forecasts they had made based on COVID-19. I also wanna emphasize going back to Brian's points, this is annualized data. So this would be either e expansion or contraction over an average of the entire year. We're not looking quarter by quarter by quarter, we're looking at the annual numbers. And so for these major kind of what we call the dominant economies in the world, it looks as though the contraction is gonna be very similar for most of the countries, again, with the exception of China. So if you look at the US, Canada, Mexico, Japan, Germany, I'm using Germany as a proxy for the EU, um, and South Korea, um, all of those look like they're gonna, with the exception of South Korea, I apologize, are looking at a contraction of anywhere six to 7%. Now, I don't wanna to get too hung up in the IMF forecast, but I do wanna show that at least with their modeling, with the expectations, and, and the systems they have in place, they're expecting the contraction rates, the drop in their economic base in all of these countries to be very, very similar. On the next slide, I do the same thing, again, going back historically, looking at what's the unemployment rate. Now, again, giving, given the, the information that Brian just presented, this would be the U3 numbers. So this would be the, the more common one that you see in the press. Um, Again, the numbers going back historically are the actual numbers that have been reported. United States unemployment rate is in the red. Um, and again, the color coding is for each of the respective countries. Again, the 2020 and 2021 numbers are forecast. So this is IMF's forecast for average unemployment rate for the entire calendar year. So again, based off of their forecasting, what they're expecting is a, a relatively large pop in the um, unemployment rate with a slight drop in that percentage rate as we get into 2021 and, and start to, to build on the economic recovery. On the next slide, I've done the same procedure. Okay, so the, here's GDP growth rate. So this is growth rates of their economies for some of what we're considering the emerging ag trading partners. So primarily in South Asia. When, when we're in this region, we look to the Asian markets as kind of our primary demand base for the products we grow in North Dakota. We ship most of our, our grains through the PNW. We have logistical advantages going into some of these countries. I also want to point out again, the red bar, the red line is the United States. Um, the yellow line is the Philippines. And I do want to target the Philippines for just a minute uh, because the Philippines is the number one buyer of US spring wheat. And so this Philippines market is, is critically important for US spring wheat because it is by far the number one buyer of US spring wheat. Now, when you look at the growth rates, the average growth rates for these South Asian countries are, have been well above what we see in the United States. Now, their economies are smaller, but they're growing faster. And what surprised me a little bit as I was looking at these, these numbers and trying to evaluate them was they're a lot, the growth rates are a lot more stable, at least within the last 10 years or so, much more stable than I had expected them to be. Now, when you look at Again, IMF's forecast for how large a contraction are they going to go through? What's that potential rebound as we get into the 2020, uh, excuse me, 2021 uh, calendar year? Uh, the percentage drop in the United States looks as though it's going to be larger than the percentage drop we have in some of these emerging uh, countries. So 
knock on wood, let's hope that again, the contractions going on in these, in these emerging uh, trading partners will not be as, as heavily impacted as it is here in the US. On the next slide, I look at for the emerging trading partners. Again, these are the companies that we look to for our growth potential. Um, this is the unemployment rates. Uh, as you can see, unemployment rates in a lot of those countries are relatively low. Um, I do think some of that is just because of the accounting procedures they're using to, to track unemployment. Uh, but again, in a relative sense, that, that is a positive thing that I'm viewing and saying, yes, there is an expectation of unemployment rates to, to increase over the next uh, 12 months or so. But again, assuming that we can, they can rebuild their economies and this COVID-19 does not have any long lasting impacts on, on people's consuming habits, it looks like Again, the forecast is for unemployment rates to, to, to go back to levels that we were pretty similar before the, the COVID-19 problem. On the next slide, I tried to focus on those countries that are major ag competitors. It's not just, uh, you know, again, who do we sell to, but what's happening in our competing countries, the countries we compete with in the global markets. So again, I use the, the red line as United States as that reference point. The blue line is Brazil and the green line is Argentina. And then we have Russia in the black, Ukraine in the gold, and Australia in the purple. I guess I wanna point, I guess I want if you can isolate out and look at what's happening, I'd like to point to both Brazil and Argentina. And, and both Brazil and Argentina have had their economies, Brazil's economy is relatively large in the global sense, uh, but they've had very large swings in their GDP growth. Their, their economy is not nearly as stable as many other uh, developing countries as we look forward. And I know uh, Brazil is very heavily dependent upon oil and oil revenue. And of course, we've seen a major drop in, in uh, crude oil prices. And so there's increasing concerns about the economic stability of the Brazilian economy in a broad sense, as well as in the Argentine economy. And then my last slide is the unemployment rates for again, our major comp competitors, the, the countries that we're competing with selling our product. And as you notice, the unemployment rate in Brazil has been um, high and growing for you know, the last seven or eight years. Um, this COVID-19 outbreak is not gonna help with that. Um, Argentina has also had relatively high unemployment rates, again, signaling that their economies are not as strong as, as they historically have been or, or relative to the, the strength of the US economy or what we would consider the major economies of the world. So just in summary, we, we are watching this very closely. We're watching not only how is the economic impacts um, uh, of COVID-19 impacting the people that we're selling to, but also the folks that are competing with us in the global market. And so with that, I'll hand things off to Tim. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Tim Petrie, Extension Livestock Marketing Economist. If we go to my first slide, I'm just basically going to talk most about uh, cattle today. And if you have questions about other market classes, like we said, just go on the question and answer. Last time, I uh, showed you the cattle and feed estimates because the report was coming out after we visited last year or last week, I should say, and uh, the report came out about what we expected. We expected cattle and feed to be down. We expected placements to be down. The average of the estimates, you know, 18% or so, and, and, uh, and a lot more cattle marketed in March, about 12% more was the estimate, and the actual even came out uh, more pronounced cattle on feed about 94% and and we placed about 77% of what we placed a year ago and we marketed over 13% more. So uh, later on, I'm gonna talk more about North Dakota prices, but this is one of the reasons why we're still seeing a good demand for seven to eight weight cattle in North Dakota because the feedlots in Nebraska sold a lot of cattle and they, they didn't place a lot of cattle, so there's extra space down there, and they got high moisture corn again, like I've said before, in the bunker, and either haul it out of manure spreader or feed it to cattle. So when we get uh, to that later on, uh, just uh, remember that. So yeah, on the charts below, it just so it shows the kind of the dramatic decline in placements, and then the increase in the fed cattle that we sold, which is actually good to sell all those cattle and get them out of the way in March because of the struggle with packing plants that we have. Now go to the next slide, please. And uh, 
the question then is how is North Dakota doing on marketing? Did we, did we sell a lot less? And then the other thing that we want to cover is for that uh, a corona food assistance program coming out how many cattle might be eligible for a payment we have no idea how much the payment is going to be but how many are eligible so two things here here's the north dakota stockman's association uh, brand inspection report for both uh, 19 and 2020 for january through march now the, uh, the cfap law again goes through april 15th so there would be a few more but this kind of would tell us how many are eligible and then uh this wouldn't be just for march like we did on the cattle and feed this would be for january through march so uh the top well you see there's steers cows heifers bulls calves horses the total and so on so 2019 gives you the number there and 2020 uh, numbers, you know, uh, some more steers and some more cows, a little less heifers and the calves a little uh, less. I kind of summarize that in the in the one easier to read, I think, in the middle, in that uh, these would be the cattle that were sold from January 1st to the end of March that would supposedly qualify for uh, any decline in price. And again, that's all to be determined by USDA uh, in total air, only down about 17, uh, close to 18,000, I guess, uh, this year versus last year. But we look, so we've got about 365,000 ca calves and, and background to cattle that sold during that time. So we got a lot waiting in line for a payment. Uh, we don't know if, Beef cows, uh, it was the intent of the law. We don't know if beef cows are going to be included or not, and we're certainly hopeful of that. On January 1st, as you see in the map at the bottom, we had, uh, you know, 995,000 uh, cows there. So go to the next slide. Uh, this is then the, this week's market report, and uh, we're, you know, unlike at the packing level where we're struggling with packers being closed and so on, our auction markets are still humming away. We had a really big week last year, sold 7,500 feeder cattle and uh, up from last week, a couple thousand. So cattle are moving and there's the prices. I'm not going to go through all of those, but you see uh, on the top there for those lightweight cattle that can go on grass, still a pretty good demand given all the circumstances and what fed cattle have done, and all the uncertainty up there uh, at, at uh, you know, for the 600 pounders at 155 and down to the uh, 450 pounders at, uh, you know, 172, 173. And then we've been talking all along about these 750 to 800 pound cattle, uh, backgrounded cattle. Again, we did an average of 130. Again, kind of a wide range that always occurs there. And just mention, you know, those fleshy cattle just uh, above the bottom. Uh, red circle there are really getting discounts so it's probably too late to tell you now but really be careful of shoveling the corn to them because you're going to get a discount but so anyway uh given all the circumstances respectable prices and i'll kind of relate that to the u.s situation in a minute so go to the, if we go to the next slide uh Here's our chart then for the 750 to eight weight cattle. Again, the red line coming down is what they have done in prices since the first of the year. And uh, so, yeah, we came down a little bit in the last couple of weeks. They're right there at, at 130. Again, the square red line, square boxes are the futures what the uh, feeder cattle futures and more, some more on that in a minute. But interesting there, I left the January and uh, March and April uh, squares on there. They closed and the April contract closed uh, yesterday. So more on that in a minute, but the April feeder cattle contract closed at 120. But our 750 to eight weight cattle, which is what the futures market is based on, sold for $130, $10 higher. So what's that telling you? It tells you there's a really good demand for calves up here and they're selling better than in the rest of the US. And so, you know, uh, I, I'm just trying to look for some silver lining. I know that's a lot lower price than you expected, but on the other hand, things could be worse 
because the uh, because they're selling for less in the, in the U.S. and we're about ten dollars higher there. And so when we go to the next slide, just to emphasize that a little more, here's the April feeder cattle, and then the CME cash index is the green line, and that CME cash index is just all the cattle, all the uh, 700 to 900 pound cattle sold at markets reported by AMS uh, in, in the US. And, uh, and the two need to come together at the end. And so you see the market worked like it was supposed to, the cash settlement price and the futures yesterday both closed right there at 119 but on and so this so that 119 is the average of all seven to nine weight cattle in the u.s but you saw on the previous slide that we did 130 on 750 to eight weight so uh again just a little silver lining and a lot a lot of bad uh, information that we've had to give you so let's go to the next slide uh and uh, very busy, busy slide. And all I wanted to do here is just throw a bunch of different headlines and there's all kinds of misinformation being thrown about. And I'm not gonna go through every one of these and you can see, but I do wanna hit some high points. On the top one, uh, kind of small print there, but this relates to that coronavirus fruit assistance program. We may have given you a little false hope last week in that we said it was, that, that USDA was going to submit it to the OMB Office of Management and Budget uh, last week, and then they had a couple weeks. And it looks like maybe the USDA didn't get it there last Friday, and, and some question is it today? And again, OMB has a couple weeks. So Again, don't, don't expect a payment here in the next couple of weeks, I guess is what we're saying, because, uh, you know, it's maybe, and maybe it rushes through before that, but it's just a monumental task USDA has, and then the OMB has to look at it and then go, go back to USDA and so on. So it'll probably take a little while. The other thing then that I want to cover is this Defense Production Act, uh, as it, on those, uh, that, that second one on the right hand side there that uh, Trump issues the, uh, you, you know, that, that the, uh, the act to, Defense Production Act to keep uh, meat plants going. And uh, again, a lot of misinformation there. And so I just want to clean a little bit of that up. One is that packers do not have to open up. Some people say now packers have to open up. They do not have to open up. It does what it does in the next one down there, Purdue says, of course, it reduces the liability and that packers have a defense, defensible answer for opening up. And, uh, but again, the liability question is probably gonna be in the courts. The packers still have to follow CDC and OSHA guidelines. And if they do that, then, uh, you know, they're on the right track. Uh, however, the act does not force employees to go to work if the packing plant opens up and says, you got to come to work employees because Trump said so. That isn't the case, like might be a wartime issue where you draft people and they got to go to war. They don't have to go to work. Uh, the government can't force them. And on the other hand, uh, if they quit, they and don't come back and they quit, they aren't eligible for unemployment benefits. So um, many of them may think about coming back to work because otherwise they, they, they wouldn't qualify for unemployment. Another thing that it does do is it keeps local government from closing plants. There have been issues where mayors have said, I'm closing down that plant because whatever, it's full of coronavirus or whatever. And so governors and mayors now can't shut a plant down because the president's uh, rule there supersedes that. Another misinformation is this prevents us from exporting, that there can be no exports. It has to stay in the U.S. for domestic consumption. I'm talking about meat here, and we do export like, you know, Frayne was talking about. We export 30% of our pork and 12, 15% of our beef and on down the line. It does not uh, 
eliminate exports. In fact, when Trump signed this bill, he said, I want exports to continue and keep on going and do everything we can to continue the export market. And he also announced that as of July 1st, the US MCA, US Mexico, Canada trade deal would be effective because all the countries have signed off. So as July 1st, that will be effective. Uh, also some information about contracting. Uh, then saying that now packers do not have to honor contracts for feedlots that have contracted cattle for them. And that is not correct. This does not uh, let them out of contractual arrangements. One aside to that is there's a thing called force majeure and Frayne is really an expert, expert on this. So later if we have a discussion there, we might bring him in. But force majeure is part of a contract and if written in says for some acts like wartime or uh, you know other act of God and other things, it's a small print in contracts that said then we can use force majeure to not honor the contract. So if that was in a contract, that's separate from the Defense Production Act. And in that case, they could uh, nullify a contract, I suppose. But uh, then is coronavirus an act of God is probably a legal question. So, you know, I'm probably opening up more can of worms here than I intended to, but, uh, you know, just doing some of this. Uh, talking about some of that. So uh, I'm not gonna read through all those in the interest of time, we gotta move along. On the bottom, that highlighted thing, I kind of think is kind of inter interesting. Congressman uh, Peterson in Minnesota uh, is promising for livestock that have to be uh, euthanized or whatever, or depopulated. He says that they're gonna be covered in the next COVID bill. And again, maybe there's some more good news in that he says there's going to be another COVID bill. And uh, probably not a surprise to a lot of us, there might be several more, but he says there's going to be one. And so I think that's the end of uh, my prepared remarks. And we'll turn it over to uh, Ron, I think, or is it David? Ron, yeah. Good afternoon. Thank you, Tim. Uh, I'm Ron Howland, Extension Farm Management with NDSU. And I just have a couple slides here to show you. I wanted to talk to you about some Bank of North Dakota loans. So my first slide then shows, uh, uh, show, uh, shows a couple uh, um, loans that Bank of North Dakota actually kind of re, uh, repurposed uh, for businesses affected by COVID. So there's two financing programs to assist North Dakota businesses. And they actually just became available uh, last Wednesday, April 29th. Uh, one of them is called the Self Loan. Uh, it's small, a small employer loan fund. And the other one is the CPRP, which is uh, a COVID-19 PACE recovery program. Now, so they've allocated $200 million for interest buy-downs and $50 million for low interest loans. Uh, the buy-downs are, uh, they, uh, of course, Bank of North Dakota will be working with lenders and the buy-downs will be leveraged to provide uh, up to two billion in loans. Now, I want to emphasize that these pro that these programs are not available for farmers at this time, but uh, just to make you aware of these programs for now, uh, those that are interested uh, in this, just go to the website uh, as, as I have listed there. Contact the Bank of North Dakota for for further details. I'm going to get into some of the. Uh, some of the information on the on these two types of loans. So the next the first the next slide shows some information regarding the self loan, the small employer loan fund, and and these are just highlights for the for the details. Please contact the Bank of North Dakota. And so this loan is for businesses that are uh, that uh, they have economic injury as as the result of COVID, and it's for North Dakota businesses with ten employees or less. Now, those are actually 10 full-time equivalents. So if you have some part-time employees that aren't working full days, uh, if your total is 10 full-time equivalents or less, you qualify. The proceeds are, are, are to support working capital, uh, recurring expenses, and inventory replenishment. Uh, these funds cannot be used for capital purchases, business expansion, um, or refinancing exi exi existing debt and also it, they can't be used for, for providing dividends. Uh, if you have gotten, if, if a business has, has gotten funds from the PPP loans, 
that does not affect your eligibility for this law. Uh, uh, the basic rule is that uh, the, you can get a loan up to the amount of fifty thousand dollars, or six year or six months of your typical operating expenses, whichever is less. Uh, very formidable terms: one percent interest, uh, one hundred and twenty months. You can also get six months um, of, of payment deferral. The next slide will show the uh, the PACE loan. And I, and I wanna apologize, I have a spelling error on the title there. It's supposed to be CPRP. I've got my uh, R's and P's mixed up. But the COVID-19 PACE Recovery Program, and this loan is also for anyone that has an economic injury recovery, uh, as a result of COVID-19. Uh, the proceeds are used to, uh, should be used to support your working capital. As with the other loans, uh, as, as with the self loan, this is not for capital purchases or business expansion, refinancing of existing debt, or relocating your business. And here again, if you have gotten funds from the PPP program, that th this does not affect your eligibility. So for businesses with 500 or less employees, the, the loan amount you, the, you can get is up to $5 million or, or six months of your typical operating expenses. For businesses with over 500 employees, uh, you get the lesser of 10 million or six months of operating expenses. The terms are 3.75% 3, 3 fixed uh, for five years. There, are, uh, a one, there is a 1% buy down available. Uh, the terms are 10% uh, amortized, amortized with a five year balloon payment. And lenders at their discretion can give you six months of deferral on payments. Now, those are the basics of their loan, of, of these loans that, that just uh, came out. And uh, so I encourage, uh, if you know somebody or uh, uh, make them aware of these, of, of these loans um, and contact the Bank of North Dakota for further details. So with that, I will turn it over to Dave. Great. Thanks, Ron. Uh, Dave Ripplinger, Bioproducts, Bioenergy Economic Specialist with NDSU Extension. Uh, just a quick summary of what's been going on in the energy markets, uh, and then we'll move into questions. Uh, basically, ethanol continues to operate about 50% capacity, as it has for the last few weeks. Uh, margins are getting a, a tish better, um, which is uh, an okay sign. Um, and then what we've actually seen and what was expected, the numbers that came out on Wednesday from last Friday, uh, you know, we basically turned the corner. Uh, stocks have gone down. Use is greater than production, uh, which is a, a good sign, although uh, times are still definitely uh, trying for, for corn ethanol refineries in the United States. Uh, kind of going along with that, too, uh, Gasoline use in the last two weeks has risen 10% over what was in the middle of the month and 15% over the low, which was basically April 1, uh, which is a good sign. Uh, oil has been a little bit more quiet this week versus last week, uh, but the, the, the impending uh, stock issue uh, is, is still on the horizon and uh, getting closer. Uh, just looking a little bit at, at production input and days and storage. So input, again, is... is energy par lands for use. So this would be ethanol that, that's used by refiners, blenders, uh, you know, as we're, as we're uh, blending gasoline. And so you can see that in the last week, things have crossed over again. So that blue input or use is now bigger than that orange production, uh, which is actually not typically the case, uh, even, even in good times. But that's where we are now as we start drawing down stocks. Uh, and that the bottom half of the chart there is, is days in storage going from uh, 27, which is just a, a bit high historically, uh, to a record of almost 54 days uh, at, the, end, at the, the beginning of April, end of March. And now we've taken a big chunk out of that in the last week uh, down to 45 days. Again, a ways to go to get back to that, that, that traditional level in the, in the 20s, uh, but, but going the right direction. Uh, just talking a bit about margins, uh, they're not as not as strong as we need them to be, but but uh, going in the right direction. For once, part of that is due to cheaper corn. Uh, part of that is due to higher prices, even though that's 73 cents per gallon at the wholesale level is is quite low. Uh, 
maybe the biggest news in terms of what's going on at the refinery is that, that the, the price for distillers is, has declined quite a bit. It was $200 for, for most of April. Uh, in the last week or so, it's fallen quite a bit. Uh, and, that, and that crush is 91 cents, and that's on a per bushel basis. Uh, we really like to see that closer to a dollar and a quarter for things to actually look healthy. Um, but, but things are kind of trending in the right direction. Uh, looking at, at gasoline use and ethanol blend rate, I mean, one of the big questions going forward is, are we going to continue to use, uh, you know, the same level of gasoline we had during the month of April? Are we going to increase or are we going to decline as the economy opens back up? Uh, if you look at that first chart and uh, that yellow line, that, that's your gasoline supplied on a weekly basis. And we see that coming up. So this is actually supply that goes from uh, the refiner to the wholesale level to the retail level. And so we, we, we have had a, a relative low a few weeks ago when we're on the upswing. And that also relates in part to higher ethanol use. Again, because if you look at that lower chart, that blend rate is again just dancing around 10% like it has been for years, uh, which is a good sign. And again, the, the bigger question going forward is, are we going to have a, a continued increase in gasoline use, uh, which will you know, pull gas uh, through the system or not? And that kind of remains to be seen. A, a lot of states are opening up today and in the upcoming weeks, and we'll see how that goes uh, and how long that's sustainable. And obviously, too, kind of doubling back to Brian's comments, you know, if, if the, you know, if, if people continue to, to lose their jobs, uh, you know, there's less, there's less income, uh, there's less need to travel, and, and that could uh, it's, it's eat away at the, the upside of, of that gasoline use. Uh, continue to be really out of whack in terms of supply and demand for, for crude oil. Uh, basically, you know, 1.6 million barrels a day, which is... 10% of what we traditionally use uh, for, for uh, crude oil, you know, that's down to 12.7 million barrels per day. Again, we're, we're producing less. Uh, we're importing still quite a bit as, as some folks are still delivering. Uh, and again, it, it's just out of whack. And that, that 16 million barrels a day across the week uh, is, is a lot considering the, the storage concerns that we have. Uh, here's my, my chart from, or my figure that I've had the last couple of weeks. Basically, in the, you know, since things have, have really gotten severe in mid-March, and this is looking just at Cushing, um, and again, so the, the working space in, in Cushing, you know, we've gone from, from things being about half full to now things being 80% full, which is about as high as you really wanted to get under normal conditions. Uh, and again, we, we've put another 25 million barrels in, in storage uh, in, in that area. Uh, you can see that with the, with the chart or with the, the graph on the right-hand side of the screen. And again, there's really not that far to go um, before things uh, become unworkable, again, because you need some space just to, to, to move the fuel around. Uh, that's what I had for my presentation, and uh, we'll move into questions and answers. Uh, I hope that some of you have used the Q&A. Uh, if not, we'll, we'll go ahead and, and look at the chat. Uh, and here's our first one for Tim. Uh, there appears to be a very large amount of anger within the livestock sector, laying the blame for low livestock prices on imported beef. Do you have any comments? Yeah, you know, whenever we have a bad situation like this, there's always uh, blame and blaming packers and imports and, and everything else. So, you know, my message there, I think, is from an industry standpoint, whether it's the beef industry, pork industry, or whatever, this is not a good time for us to be uh, fighting and pointing fingers and so on. The more united we can be in helping get through this, the, the better we are. Actually, uh, from an import standpoint, you know, we just showed some charts on imports, but you know, our imports are actually uh, down. And, uh, but, but again, uh, you know, in, in some cases with our big demand for hamburger, we don't have enough here. And so we do, yes, we do get some from some other countries and, uh, and uh, you know, that's likely to continue. So that's great. Thanks, Tim. Are, are there any yeah. other questions for, oh, here we go. Oh, there's been, and it looks like it's for Tim again, I uh, quite, quite a bit of renewed interest in M cool. I don't know if there's anything to fix this. Any thoughts? 
Yeah, you know, there's uh, several organizations have contacted Trump and, and the legislators, and there are some congressmen looking that way. And, and so uh, that's all to be determined in Congress. And uh, Congress is overrun with other things right now, I think, rather than that. But it's certainly one of the things that is, is also the investigation of Packers and all those things are on the board in, in the Congress. So, uh, you know, when Congress gets to it, they're probably going to look at it. Again, our previous M. Cool was deemed by the World Trade Organization as to be, uh, you know, not appropriate. And so, uh, you know, it would have to be written different, I guess I can say from the, for sure, from the previous bill, but it's all up to Congress now and they're so busy with coronavirus that, you know, some of these things I think are maybe going to get put on the back burner. Oh, it looks like a question for Frayne. Uh, logistics and export. What are you, what are you hearing? Uh, so, so far, I've not heard any uh, disruptions or any problems uh, based on the uh, rail at normal um, the exports out of the ports out of the PNW at least for this region have been uh, going smoothly uh, we did get recently some now reports of some additional uh, buying Ch uh, China came in and bought some US soybeans for delivery in this uh, marketing year which is is favorable for this region because of the kind of the logistical supply issues so um, I have not heard of any any problems or issues showing up yet uh, again, everything seems to be working smoothly. Um, I do know in talking to a couple of the the uh, kind of elevators and processors in the region, um, their biggest fear right now is is not necessarily supply disruption from their either from the farmer or being able to get the product shipped out. It's internally with with their own people getting sick because um, there's some rules that if you have a positive case of COVID-19. Um, you need to shut down, you need to clean your facilities out before you can start to reopen again. And so there are some concerns about what happens if some of the employees get sick as we in particularly now move into springs work and the peak load demand we have on labor at that time. But um, for shipments, it seems to be working pretty smoothly so far. Right. Thanks, Frank. And just a follow up comment on that, too, uh, that the participant had heard some problems for companies shipping out of Canada. Um, yeah, I guess I haven't heard anything specifically shipping out. Of I, again, I know the borders are open for trans line because it is considered to be a topic or priority issue. So um, even though people are not allowed to go back and forth, at least we can get product back and forth. Yeah, and then a, a question for me, uh, looking at the, the dependency of corn price on ethanol, do you look for driving and gas use as a predictor for corn futures? Well, yeah, I mean, there's definitely a, a relationship. You know, we, we, we traditionally use a third of the corn crop for, for ethanol production. Uh, ethanol production has declined by half. Uh, you know, as gasoline use has increased in the last few weeks, um, ethanol use has gone with it. You know, if we can see a, a continued recovery across the summer, which again is, is driving season, uh, that will definitely be supportive of higher corn prices. It, it's, it's just, in many respects, really tough to tell uh, how uh, the motoring public will, will behave this summer. Uh, you know, will, will folks take longer trips? Uh, will, will, will shelter in place and work from home, you know, tend to dominate? You know, we really don't know. Uh, and, and, and there's a lot more, too. I mean, it clearly plays a role, but one of the questions I have, too, is, with the disruption on the livestock side, I mean, that's clearly, you know, impacting corn prices as well. And so there's a lot of different factors that are, that have to be considered. But for me, I mean, that's, that's definitely kind of the leading indicator. Uh, what's challenging is it's not easy to get uh, real time information on, on gas use on, on vehicle miles traveled, uh, which make that a little bit more difficult to track. And in fact, I mean, the best way to look at it is just to see, you know, how much gas is supplied on a week by week basis, which is still a trailing indicator. And if there are any more questions, uh, as things have quieted down a little bit, as we get towards the end, I'd ask if the panelists had anything they'd want that they'd like to add to their existing remarks or things that they thought of while others were speaking. 
One thing that I would add, um, based on Frank's comment, a lot of those emerging trade partners and our largest egg trade partners are also uh, very large markets for ethanol or very large targets for ethanol export market development. Uh, South Korea and the Philippines, Canada are three of our five largest markets. Brazil, oftentimes, is, is an emerging market. And then really those, those Southeast Asian countries, uh, Vietnam, Malaysia, Indonesia, are, are targets for growth. And so their uh, relative resilience uh, to, to COVID is, 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 is good news. Um, uh, you know, another, another small piece of good news for, for the ethanol industry. Just to, to follow up again, I wanna thank everybody for participating. Uh, again, this is, this is gonna become a, you know, it's gonna continue as a weekly uh, program for Extension Agribusiness. Uh, as we've kind of moved over to this webinar, uh, uh, license this webinar setting we're going to keep this same url from week to week at the same time so feel free to come back uh the practice is a little bit different you know you were in a waiting room um we also had to use the q a tool now uh, and so uh we ask it you know if you're enjoying this to, you're welcome back week by week or to share it with your colleagues uh, and as scott pointed out in the in the chat uh please do uh share your your feedback with us in terms of how we're doing uh, and what we can do better and what we can add. Um, and so that, uh, I'd like to thank everybody uh, for, for joining us this week and, and we'll talk to you again uh, next Friday. Bye.